Very often, vegans have this idea, um, this belief, which is completely understandable, um, that you're either vegan and you're part of the solution, or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem. It's a totally understandable belief for many mm -hmm. obvious reasons, probably. Um, and nevertheless, that is also, I believe, an inaccurate belief, and that can, you know, cost us supporters that we really need. So rather, many, many people, for many reasons, are neither able in their own minds or, or willing to actually become fully vegan. And if we do not invite those people to use their influence in whatever way they can to support a cause that really needs all the help it can get, then we are not advocating for this cause in the most effective way possible. So I, I always recommend that we ask others not to quote unquote go vegan, but to become what I call a vegan ally. A vegan ally is a supporter of veganism even though they're not yet fully vegan themselves. And so in my own experience, um, having been in this movement for I think three decades now, I'm dating myself, but um, I have seen over and over again that some of the people who actually do the most good in terms of number of animals spared, for example, or impact mm -hmm. they have, they're not vegan and they're not even vegetarian. They're, for example, journalists, you know, who reach out to me and other people, they'll do like articles on carnism that reach millions sometimes, you know, hundreds of thousands mm. of people. Some of the people who donate to my organization Beyond Carnism, which is 100% dependent on, on donations are not vegan, but they really believe in the cause and they wanna help us create a more vegan world. Um, People are, you know, most people, most people are find animal agriculture offensive once they really make the question. If we give them the opportunity to participate in the transformation, then we invite people in to use their influence in a whole variety of ways. Um, and I think this is really important. And a, a part of being a vegan ally um, is to really be as vegan as possible. And so I also encourage people to really think of carnism and veganism on a spectrum. And mm -hmm. where you're at on this spectrum is in some ways less important, some ways, than, than where you're heading. And to really encourage people to be as vegan as possible. First of all, this is the only rational ask because nobody can be more <laughs> vegan than what's possible for them. Now, a lot of vegans get stuck on this because mm. we all have learned to believe that we're actually mind readers when we're not. I know what's possible for you. We all believe that we know what is possible for other people because mm -hmm. of our observations. But what's possible for somebody else is what they believe is possible for them. So I'll give you an example. Um, I had somebody once say to me, um, Melanie, you should be a fruitarian. And they like made a pretty strong case for why I should be fruitarian. And I was like, well, you know, I, you know, I, I, what about the winter? I was living in Boston at the time. It's cold in the winter. Like, oh no, 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 don't worry. Like you're fine. You can, you can eat this, this, and this. You can warm your food up. Just don't cook it. Um, it, it was these fruits I was talking about. Well, you know, I travel a lot. Oh, if you plan in advance, you can be fine to travel. Well, I, I like going out to dinner. Oh, there are plenty of places are accommodating. I totally sounded like a non-vegan, right? And I'm, I'm all defensive. I'm all like coming up with, and then I just said, I just can't do it. It's not possible. They said, Melanie, it is possible. You live across the street from Whole Foods. It's possible. And I, that was really interesting for me because this is exactly the way that we approach non-vegans. It's not possible for somebody if it feels like it's not sustainable for them. Um, and so when we ask people to be as vegan as possible, we're letting them be experts on their own experience. We're reducing defensiveness. Um, mm -hmm. so what are people gonna say? No, I'm not gonna be as vegan as possible. Like, well, then you're already being as vegan as possible. Um, and frankly, if everyone in the world were as vegan as possible, the world would become vegan fairly quickly. And this reminds me of uh, a poll by the Sentience Institute uh, where they, they looked at U.S. adults and found that uh, around 49% of the U.S. public supported a ban on factory farming uh, and 47% supported a ban on slaughterhouses. You know, you would never imagine that there was this much support for institutional change simply by looking at the number of vegans in the U.S. But there is. Um, and, uh, and I guess to kind of emphasize what you're saying, uh, it seems like a terrible missed opportunity to try and to not to take advantage of that public support for animal rights because these people aren't vegan.
And that's very, very well put, um, very well put. And, and it's true. And I think it's also important just to acknowledge that vegans who believe this, that, you know, if you're not vegan, you're part of the problem. It makes mm. rational sense that they would believe that, you know, we are living in the midst of a global atrocity. Uh, atro yeah atrocity. <laughs> Carnism is a global atrocity. And, you know, when you're awake to this reality, many people who, you know, have open eyes and are like moving through this world aware of the tremendous suffering that's happening every moment of every day, mm. you, you cannot not be affected by that. Nobody gets through this unscathed in some ways. And many people feel, you know, vegans feel this very strong conviction and moral outrage. And I want to end this atrocity as quickly as possible mm. and are also developing trauma, you know, post-traumatic responses to that. And, and when you're traumatized, as many vegans are completely understandably, because an atrocity is by definition, it's a mass traumatic event. And when you are a part of this, you know, by simply by being awake to it and aware of it, um, it really affects your psyche. It really affects the way that you view the world. You start to view the world in uh, through what I call a trauma narrative in this. You know, you start to see people as either victim, perpetrator or hero, and you really lose your capacity for nuance. We start to put everyone, mm. including ourselves, into one of these three categories. Um, we hold ourselves and others to impossible standards. So it becomes increasingly difficult to recognize that somebody can be a perpetrator, AKA eating animals and a hero, AKA part of the solution at the same time. And we have this kind of like, you know, very fundamentalist all or nothing thinking, I would call mm -hmm. it traumatic thinking, you know, it, it's, this is really entrenched in the movement right now. So it makes a lot of sense why people believe you have to be vegan to be a part of the solution and and it's very important that we have conversations like this one so that we, you know, hopefully start healing some of this rigid thinking for vegans themselves and so that vegans can advocate more effectively. So to, to give an example of the, the black and white framing we see, um, some animal, animal right, grassroots animal rights, rights organizations uh, encourage activists who are outreaching the public to say things like, um, you're either vegan or you're an animal abuser. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are like specifically on this kind of messaging during outreach conversations. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, there's the, this uh, therapist, uh, psychotherapist, Terrence Real, who writes relationship books. And, and he says, you know, you have a choice. He's talking to, about working with married couples. He says to the married couples, you have a choice. Um, you can be married or you can be right. You decide what you want to be. <laughs> um, and I would say this to vegans, you know, you can be accurate in the language that you use. And e in this case, even abuse is not accurate, right? It, I mean, you could say it is, but by definition under the law, you know, um, or you can be, or you can be effective. You know, we want to use words like mortar and corpse when we're talking about eating animals. We want to use like all sorts of terminology. Many vegans feel like they have to be, you know, exposing carnism and not colluding with the system by not using euphemisms, for example, mm -hmm. um, just doesn't work. Um, and typically it doesn't work and it turns people off. There have been, um, you know, research has shown that when people feel that their dignity is harmed or that there's even a threat to harm their dignity, your dignity is your sense of self-worth. Your dignity is your feeling of, you know, that you are a fundamentally worthy being on this planet, that you have, when you feel your sense of dignity, you feel that you have just as much right as anybody else to be treated with respect. Mm. And we can talk about dignity later. It's, it's central, absolutely central to all of the work that we do at Beyond Carnism, and not the least of which is um, through our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, where we train vegan advocates how to communicate more effectively. When you communicate in a way that harms somebody's dignity, when you communicate in a way that shames them, that basically communicates that they are somehow less than, less worthy of being treated with respect, um, you increase the chances that they are going to have a defensive reaction, a defensive reaction, meaning that they will go into a state of hyper arousal. It could be minor, it could be major. So this is a state of you know, fight or flight, basically. Mm -hmm. um, everybody knows what I'm talking about because everybody's been defensive, you know? Yeah. And, 
when a person is in this more defensive state, um, they lose their capacity for, not entirely, but they have a reduced capacity for rational thinking and they are less likely to be able to stay connected with their empathy. So you basically, when you shame somebody, you are engaging in the very, you are increasing the chances that they will be resistant to your message. And you're demonstrating to onlookers that you're not a safe person to, mm -hmm. if you, we want people to be open to our message, we need to create an environment where people will feel safe enough to allow themselves to be open to actually hearing about how they are acting in a way that's violating their own integrity and participating in an atrocity. That in and of itself is a hard ask, even when you're creating a safe environment. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it kind of reminds me, I got this personal story, I guess, where I was at an animal rights march um, and I had this, this, bag, uh, this bag on me and I think the brand, I didn't know this at the time, also um, paid some money towards hunting or something, or it was somehow involved in trophy hunting. Um, and a vegan came up to me uh, and informed me about that. She's like, oh, your your bag, um, did you know that that bag supports like tr trophy hunting? And I just blurted out straight away something like, oh, I've, I've had it for ages, I've had it, I've had it for years. Melanie, I hadn't even had it that long. <laughs> and I reflected on this afterwards thinking, wow, is that what it feels like for a fur, for a fur wearer? Where I was, I was like you say, I was very heightened, and I wasn't thinking rationally, um, and I wasn't particularly open. I was on the defensive. Um, so even when people are coming up to you and being pleasant about something, because we have these, we want to see ourselves as good people, I guess. Um, it's it's so easy to be very closed off and very defensive, even if they're being nice. So if you're going to go up to someone and 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 say something like, you know, if they, if they say I'm trying to cut down on my meat consumption, and you say to them, well, you're either vegan or you're an animal abuser. I mean, that's that's explicit. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but it seems like that's going to induce some, some uh, defensiveness. People can just think about how you would feel if you were on the, the you know, on the receiving mm -hmm. end of that kind of communication. We, we all know what it feels like to be shamed. We all know because we live in a world that is so profoundly relationally dysfunctional that shaming is like is normal. And, mm. you know, it's so normal as to be unremarkable. Nevertheless, it's counterproductive when you actually want somebody to change. You know, we people are we are all so defensive against feeling shame. Shame is an incredibly debilitating, painful emotion. And uh, and it is something that most of us carry around quite a bit of because we live in such a dysfunctional world where mm -hmm. we have been exposed to shaming uh, attitudes and behaviors, you know, since since we were born, essentially. Um, when we shame people, you know, or when we feel shamed or the threat of shame, we wrap ourselves in the emotional armor to protect ourselves from being further shamed. We do mm -hmm. not open our hearts and minds. We withdraw or attack in self-defense. And I am not talking about not holding people accountable for problematic behaviors or for trying, you know, I'm not suggesting that we not try to change the system and change the world. We obviously need to do that. And I believe that those of us who really care about this issue have a responsibility to be open to how we can work toward change in the most effective way possible. And when we ask somebody to change behaviors or we're highlighting problematic behaviors, we really need to do that in a way that honors their dignity. And to do that, you know, we start with our own attitude. So if you, you know, notice for, for many vegans, and again, this is understandable and it's, it's problematic and inaccurate. I, I give, when I'm giving my talk to vegans and I'm talking about shaming and not shaming people, um, you know, I will, I will encourage vegans to, you know, start with your attitude, try to not put yourself in a position of moral superiority, because mm -hmm. when you, when you believe that you are morally superior, um, you will perceive others as morally inferior. And that is the attitude that's shaming. So many vegans um, find that they struggle with this. I would suggest, number one, it's, we need to differentiate healthy and unhealthy anger, right? Anger is an appropriate, it's an important emotion. Anger is the legitimate, healthy response to in, emotional response to injustice. Anger becomes problematic when either we don't recognize it for what it is. We don't see it as simply an emotion, a data point that's alerting us that something feels unjust to us. It may or may not be unjust, but something seems unjust to us. It becomes problematic when we don't see it as the emotion as it is, or when it hijacks us and becomes intense, or when it has the charge of contempt. 
And this is one of the most important things I think that vegans, everybody, everybody um, could, could do with understanding. When we feel contempt, that is a red flag that we have placed ourselves in a position of moral superiority. And as soon as we have done that, we have bought into an illusion that, you know, this myth, I write about this in Powerarchy, we have bought into this belief in a hierarchy of moral worth that some individuals or groups are more worthy of being treated with respect of moral consideration than others. Mm-hmm. Notice your contempt. That's a red flag. And if you're feeling contempt, probably you're communicating to somebody in a way that is shaming. So if we can, as vegans, if we can recognize when we feel contempt and recognize that as an illusion that we have bought into, this will help us step down from that place and be less likely to shame. And frankly, the antidote to contempt and shame is the same. It's, it's empathy. You know, when, when we're in a place of contempt, it means we've lost connection with our empathy. It's hard to look down on someone when you're looking at the world through their eyes. When we're in a place of shame, we've lost connection to our empathy for ourselves. Wow, that was great. <laughs> Thank you.